forth to HRSA and working to set up these assignments for MCH epidemiologists in states. It started out, I think, with three states having MCH assignees, and then the program just sort of evolved. So, you know, I don't know when they added in the um, summer internships for students, MCH oh, students. Oh, right, the right. But that, but that all came out of yeah, that, that groundwork that you yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I, I don't know, maybe a maximum of seven or eight states at one point had permanent sightings, two to three mm -hmm. year sightings for okay. CDC to work directly with the MCH directors. And there were two or three of us that supervised all their signings, so we'd go on these trips all around the country. I got to go right. to Alaska, people are hey. Hawaii, and there was Not a sign in Washington yeah. State, yeah. Mississippi, South Carolina. You know, there are other less fun places. But you, <laughs> got to, but you got to see, I mean, all corners of the U.S. Though. California. We, we would combine, there were three of us who were supervising, and we just sort of combined site visits. So we'd all go to all the states so we would know what was happening. Gosh. Gotcha. Oklahoma okay. at one point. But, right. So that was that was actually very it was somewhat tedious, but it was very fun work because we knew that we were really trying to reach into providing more support to right. MCH directors and state health departments. And we developed the MCH epidemiology conference out of it. <laughs> we meaning the whole group, person, right, CDC right. jointly, uh, you know, so a lot of stuff evolved from that little assignment under George Bush, and he did put money into it, I mean, they did put several million dollars into funding these activities initially, so. But still, it's, you know, it's just, it's remarkable to think, right, that like that kind of small pot of funding and that charge, right, then became the impetus for what is now the entire infrastructure for the entire country for MCH, right? I to mean, some extent. Well, her I mean, you already, about Title V and other things. Yeah, and, and, and was there, uh, but. Title V was undergoing some changes, too, that, because that's when it became a block grant. Exactly. So um, funding was freed up from within the block grant. People didn't want a block grant. They thought it was awful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because there were all these signature programs okay. They were being combined, and then it was up to a state to decide how to use the money. Oh my God! Right, and what if they didn't want to fund my program? And yeah, but then eventually their requirements got put within the block grant. You know, particularly assessment and reporting, so that they still had to report on all these same things that they had been getting funded for, but they just chose how to right. spend more of the money. Right. So part of what happened with having MCH epidemiologists there at that time was to help train them to do better assessments. Hmm. Okay. You know, because they didn't have to do that much reporting prior to that. They didn't even have to, they weren't responsible for health indicators and so a lot of what the epi work was about was getting MCH directors and people in the MCH departments comfortable with dealing with data and mm. doing assessments, um, analytic Right. Work. So everything, you know, all that data now that right, like we can go to the Title Five website, right, that, that data warehouse and pull down, okay, what were your stats last year, two exactly. years ago? Yeah. How were you performing against the healthy people indicators? Exactly. All, that. all of that was it evolved out of the block grant but also out of support for people to understand MCH epi and how to use PRAMS data. And that's why we had the MCH conference, because it gave states an opportunity mm -hmm. to find out how other states were reporting on PRAMs and reporting their assessments. And, and then um, HRSA also had set aside money for SPRANS, I don't think that exists anymore, but there were special projects of regional and national significance. So states could apply for additional funding right. to do additional analytic work. Okay. So. Okay, because I've heard that acronym, mm -hmm. you know, program, but I didn't know what the yeah. program actually focused yeah. on. Yeah. So there's still some funding that goes. I think a lot of that money went into the MCH Epi Division Office. Okay. okay. So it's still there, but it's just being used to help support the, the in, you know, being able to tap into the data, right, right, the and indicators and, and stuff like that. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So it's interesting. I mean. This is my like 25, 30 year perspective on public health, but this is how it evolves, how public health yeah. evolves. Like I kind of see the evolution of it all and to be involved in that part of public health. 
of. Well, and it also, but I, I mean, it, I, I think that it speaks to kind of your professional legacy in many ways because you know coming in as a as a new MCH professional, right? And they, mm -hmm. as I'm sitting in these classes, I mean, these are the infrastructure systems that you helped build that I learned about in foundations. Mm -hmm. As you know, if you're going to work in this field, the things you need to understand yeah. are, yeah, yeah. you know, Title V. Prams, <laughs> these basic surveillance systems, um, you know, the infant mortality data coming out of vital statistics, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're taught to go into those data sets, and and that's what we start to learn right. how to that's be professionals in this field, right? But initially. like you built that. <laughs> well, I was there, but you know, we but kind of built the that structural, team. yeah, the team around it and how to use it. And um, oh, I just I was going to say something, I just lost it. I can't remember what I was just saying. <laughs> but that was that's in those that was what was um, fun about being at CBC in those yeah. days because um, we had a lot of independence. I mean, if we thought something was important, if you can co convince your manager or directors or somebody, they say, "Okay, do it." You know, so you got you had a chance to be creative and try to think about how do you develop systems of surveillance and systems of activities that you can build on. You know, that's so oh, I'm sure the Rye syndrome surveillance was somebody's idea about we need to see how many of these cases are occurring in the U.S. We need to figure out how to track them. Mm, right. You know, and so um, so. Um, CDC and the states have always worked very closely together, a lot of the epidemiologists, the state health departments, or former EIS officers. Mm -hmm. So you could develop relationships to work with them on how to collect data. Gotcha. You know, and, and so the early systems, RISE was sort of like a very early system to look at child health issues. Okay. And then PRAMS came along, and then adolescent health, YRBS, right. you know, surveillance, you, the, what is it called? You've, Behavioral risk factors right. yeah. was developed around the same time as PRAMS. I think that developed okay. first, and then they said, "Well, we need to do something to see what's happening with pregnant women and infants in terms of right. surveillance." And so, you know, all these ideas were just people who said, "Well, we need to do that." You know? Right, and then it was, "Oh, yes, there's a need. Okay, let's do yeah. this." Right, and, and so you actually got um, supported if, if it seemed like you had a good idea. Right. And you were willing to work your butt off to get, you know, to get started, and, you know, and, and that's what that really what was happening. And in the meantime, it was so interesting. I just have to say, Bert was there in a parallel branch, right? Right. You know, so I would would see him working on these really fascinating issues around birth control risk factors, and you know, and the other thing is we always had to present our work at the end of the year. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, in like, front of everybody. Well, or the director. The oh, okay. Mm -hmm. The center director, and then the center director would decide what projects got presented to the CDC director. So, you know, I would know stuff that Bert was working on because he always had these interesting presentations. Right. I always got roped into doing these presentations too. You know, so it really was kind of fun. You know, you you got to know people that way. So that's how I ended up here. Because because when he ended up here that you know brought you on. Or or Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, yes, exactly. Huh. So um Bill Roper had been the dean here. Right. Before he went over to the medical school, right. the dean of school of public health. And he recruited Bert huh. to come interview for the department position and Bert got that. And Bill skipped on over to the medical school. He was like, now that I've you know, put somebody in. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, he always, always had bigger fish to fry. You know, he went from pain. But anyway, um, so Bert had been here a couple of years, I think. And I actually left CDC before he did. Because okay. I left in 2001. I put in 20 years. And I was like, yeah, this time is it. Done. And I was in a position that was pure management. That was right, and it takes. It had a the really nice it. title. I mean, it was a very respectful. Position. I was the associate director for science for the National Center for Chronic Disease. Okay. 
prevention and health promotion. So that center managed just an enormous number of programs. Division of Reproductive Health was like this right. teeny, teeny part of the center. So I went from being in the Division of Reproductive oh, Health, right. yeah, to working on cancer and diabetes and car cardiac disease and arthritis and dental disease and the office. I mean, how did you, how did you like that? That's a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, got, I did a lot of reading during that time. And um, my position as, as the, was a science policy officer, mm -hmm. basically, for the center. So, um, yeah, I read a lot of publications that were coming out. I had to, I sort of had to do final improvement for a lot of them publications in all of those fields and That's participate. An expert on everything to be able to do that level of review. Yeah. No sleep. No sleep. <laughs> so, thank God by then, you know, you could go you could go you didn't have to go to the library. You could sit at your desk and pull up articles from PubMed, you know, so right. I would spend like nights reading all kinds of things in different areas. And I think the the longest documents were always the Surgeon General's reports on smoking and health because they came out every year. And a lot of it was written by the Office on Smoking and Health, and by the time I reviewed it, it was pretty much done. But you know, I still had to right. review it and know the content and make some final suggestions. And, and it was like, you know, divisions to publications like that all the time. So. They weren't as massive, but you know, there was there always stuff going on. And um, the thing that I enjoyed doing as a science policy person was to develop the uh, policy and research priorities for the center, which cool. meant that, yeah, and it was working in conjunction with schools of public health and with um, the divisions. And it allowed us also to put much more emphasis on community health and community participatory research mm -hmm. as a primary focus. Because that's what I had been working with in the Division of Reproductive Health. We had started doing, we did a lot of CDPR right. in the early 90s. Well, throughout that time, we were doing infant mortality work. We always did parallel projects, CDPR projects, as well as you know, data analysis. And I didn't realize that the CDC you know, was doing CBPR alongside. I just well, didn't, I didn't, I didn't know Well, somebody, you know, like I said, it was in the days of, if you wanted to do it, you could, you if could you could it. convince somebody to get the money, you could do it. So actually, that's how we got the money to do it after the, as part of the health disparities work that grew out of the funding that grew out of the Bush administration. We decided when we took that year off, we said we're not going to do a medical model because that hasn't told us anything in, what, right. 50 years. So part of the decision was to do work more directly with the community and um, to try to understand what pregnancy was like for African American women, which meant we had to do ethnographic work and to include community's perspective as we were doing the ethnographies. So we actually brought in community advisory groups. And, well, it was contractual. We contracted out with places like UCLA and I can't remember who the primary was at Harlem. But at places where, you know, we wanted the funding to have um, academic people working directly and with voices from the community. Mm -hmm. So we developed a lot of our version of CBPR at the time. Gotcha. A lot, and it was sort of like, it wasn't exactly underground, but it was encouraging, you know, people who had an interest in uh, qualitative work to have a chance to do more of it. Right, right. So we funded UCL, UCLA for a while, and the community didn't like the relationship, so we took the money from UCLA and gave it to Drew Medical School. Anyway, yeah. they, they eventually just started giving money directly to the community in LA, but we also funded the University of 
Illinois, Chicago, right. and um, I guess it was Columbia University. I can't remember who. The, I must have been Columbia University, yeah, yeah. but they did the work in Harlem. You know, um, was that with NMPP or who was the community group that they were doing that? It was just one community group. Okay. It was a series of groups, including the Urban League. Okay. Yeah. And at one point, I think Urban League was getting some of the funding because we wanted to start getting the money closer to the community right. Right. so they could hire people from the community to train in ethnography and data collection. Mm -hmm. And um, Atlanta got a project eventually um, through Emory. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a co project with Spellman. But once again, the idea was to train community people to do the data, participate in the data collection and design stuff. Right, and get some of that institutional knowledge out of universities and into the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the project that you did was sort of an evolution of mm -hmm. some of that thinking and work, too, where it was like... Um, With R4P and... Yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. By then, Vijay and I had both left CDC, but that was sort of where the thinking about it right. began. Right. Yeah, because um, when I left my job, Vijay took over a lot of the okay. projects I was working on. I got kicked upstairs to be the director of science policy. She took <laughs> she took on the responsibility of continuing to okay. to help that. And so, how many years did you do the the you know? Associate Director of, of Policy. I Director survived policy. three years. Ooh. <laughs> That's a lot. That's no, a lot. it actually was, it, it was compared to all the other time. It, it, but it was just, um, it was not fun. Yeah. Because I couldn't do any of do. my own work, basically, right. except this research, you know, um, strategy, strategic plan. But right. the rest of it was. And it, get, it got you away from the, the, the you know, the disease detective part, right? Like the oh, reason yeah. that you were interested yeah, in it doing it. Very much so. Me. And, um, you know, there's a, a dirty side to all agencies. Mm -hmm. It got, I got to see that. Mm -hmm. That's when I said, you know, mm -hmm. not, not doing this anymore because I got to see how the sausage was really made, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> in an administrative yeah. management uh -huh. Uh -huh. kind of situation. And that bothered me a little bit. So when you left CDC, where did you go? I went to Morehouse College. Okay. But it's under, it was very unusual to undergraduate program really? in Morehouse rather than the medical school. And I went there to set up a research center on health disparities. Mm -hmm. And we particularly wanted to look at social determinants. And I, you know, there's no point in trying to set up a Research in their health disparities in a medical school if you want to look at social determinants. Right, because you're going to fight for everybody. Yeah, they don't even know that. Well, I didn't, shouldn't say they don't understand, but it's just not. It's not what they're it's, trained to do. Yeah, it's not their discipline. So I specifically went there to try to work with people in sociology and okay. psychology and other fields to, that, that really had much more of a social theory kind of perspective on Right. And on, on African American culture and and social theory, but maybe not didn't know the health or the public health perspective of it. But I wanted to use their disciplinary knowledge and bring them into right. once again working in community related research. Right. But again, I think right as you're talking about you know health disparities and really wanting to eliminate health disparities, right? Like the the biomedical model has not gotten us there, no matter exactly. how much we try to put more energy or money yeah. or whatever behind mm -hmm. that, right? Um, and so I think, you know, as you were saying, right, like really trying to say if we're going to do this, we need to have folks who deeply understand the communities that we're working with and the challenges that they're facing, but also the strengths that are in these communities, right? right? To be yeah. able to say how do we build a model that works off of the assets and resilience in these communities, mm -hmm. right, so that folks can find their own solutions. Yeah, and so Epi really went into the back, I mean, got further yeah. and further back in my toolbox, because by then the data was useful for some things, but I didn't see how just another Epi study was going to help anything. Right. And I needed to really work with people who could teach me mm. about theory, mm -hmm. particularly sociology and social economics. Right. 
Um, psychology and health behavior, you know, I had gotten to know quite a bit by then because of my work at CDC, so I, I understood health behavior models. Right. And that wasn't going to be the answer either. Right. Right. You so, really needed to get more to the root of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think too, as I'm as I'm thinking about, you know, the many of those studies that you did in those years at CDC, right? I mean, I and I said this to you that it, one of the things that was so striking was like. Y'all went through and one by one, every excuse the biomedical people could give for like, well, maybe, you know, this is like, you know, black women don't eat vegetables mm -hmm. during the during yeah, pregnancy like, or what, like whatever nonsense reasons that people right. are coming up with, right? Yeah. And, but you guys were systematic and just every single one, bam, 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 bam. No, it's not that. No, it's not that. No, yeah, it's and not that's that, what, right? And that's what was good about Viracus and Prams, because right. Prams collect, you know, people used to say, oh, it's all that smoking that black women do. Black women do not smoke at high rates. Smoke. It's like, yeah. no, that's not so common in the low work rate. It might be a really important factor in the general population, right. but it's no, not. Among black women. Yeah, exactly. And so all of these things that are true risk factors didn't explain it because we did go through it, you know. Right. And, and, <laughs> and this was particularly helpful for that. And then we had, you know, then the studies that we did were right. also kind of reinforced it. Right, but it, but it makes sense to me as you're saying, you know, I've done all the epidemiological work, like another epi study was not going to get us mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. like. And I can, I can recall talking to um, people in the Office of Smoking and Health in the 90s because smoking rates were much lower among teens, African American teens, mm -hmm. compared to whites. And I, you know, I can, I remember saying, what is that? Did you ever think to look into that? And they were like, Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> and, and